Hi, folks. Welcome to the next uh, next cluster of sessions. Um, we've got uh, a couple. We got a watch party going. We got a couple of videos, but the speakers are here to answer questions afterwards. Um, and we've got two sessions on uh, on virtual escape rooms, um, which is awesome. Um, but our first session is called A la Carte Library: Asynchronous Offerings for the Overscheduled Law School. And our speakers are Rachel Evans. Geraldine Kaleem, Jason Tubinis, Heather Simmons, Amy Taylor, and Stephen Wolfson. And uh, let's uh, play the video. Welcome to the a la carte library. This session will share ideas and methods for offering asynchronous instruction to your law school community, prepared and served up by the law librarians at UGA's School of Law. Wherever you are zooming in from for CaliCon this year, and whatever time of day it is, we sure hope your stomach isn't empty. Get ready for some mouth-watering content. First up, our primary analogy, the bento box, which we feel is an excellent way to illustrate the benefits of modular asynchronous instruction. Our approach to delivering educational content um, has been to offer as many different types of programming and, and using as many delivery methods as we can think of. We then offer all of this material to our students um, as educational materials, regardless of the delivery method. Um, in this way, uh, the approach is modular in that everything sort of fits together as a whole unit, um, but it's also made of discrete parts that students can select from. So a little bit like choosing what you want to eat from a bento box, um, this approach allows our students to pick and choose the lessons that interest them and the delivery methods that, in, that appeal to them or work best for them. One benefit of working in the online space is that it opens up at the educational methods um, that maybe are a little more difficult in in-person instruction. And we've been trying to embrace as many as we, as we can uh, to deliver uh, educational material to our students in the most effective ways possible. And I'm going to talk about baby spinach. Now, if you just heard spinach and you thought for even just a moment of Popeye taking a big can of the stuff and squeezing it, all that slimy green stuff flies out. And, you know, there's part of you at some point had that image of like, oh, OK, so take that. Oh. Yeah, that is what our students feel when they have to format their 1L brief. You know, writing a brief is hard enough. And then you have to do all sorts of crazy different page numbers, um, come up with a table of contents, come up with a table of authorities. So much stuff is going on. So, but it's spinach can be really tasty, um, either just by itself, you know, or spruced up part of it. It can be incredibly delicious. You just have to kind of approach it with that mindset. So that's what I do. Um, I try to make the formatting the brief as fun and engaging as possible. So there's just lots of, let's look at all the cool stuff that Microsoft Word has to offer you. I really try to emphasize the really interesting and cool tools that are available in Microsoft Word and how these tools aren't only helpful for formatting the brief, they're also going to be helpful throughout their, the rest of their law school career, as well as their legal career, just knowing how styles work, for example, or how to make an automatic table of contents. These things are going to not only help you write a good brief, they'll also help you come up with better outlines and they'll just make, you know, your practice easier. You're just coming up with documents that much more simply and efficiently. That's the thesis behind baby spinach. You really have to kind of lay it all out there. You really have to work with work with your spinach. But when you do, not only are you getting something tasty, you're also getting something really helpful and healthy. Our session was called Adapt, Improve, Overcome, Revisiting, Studying for Law School. But I really wanted to call it Everything You Think You Know About Studying is Wrong. We decided to schedule this as a live session in January, soon after the 1Ls got their first set of grades. This is when half our students find out that they are in the bottom half of the class for the first time in their life. We're really glad we decided to record it as only one person attended the live session on Zoom. My colleague, Savannah Nolan, did the first part of the presentation, which was about recognizing that law school is really one giant independent study course. No one is going to make you do the work. You have to figure out your own 
discipline and motivation and structure to learn all the material. In the second part, I talked about evidence-based learning and cognitive theory, covering specific techniques on how the brain learns new information. Traditional study methods, rereading your notes and highlighting your casebook actually give you a false sense of security that you know the information. Flashcards, if you are honest and do not peek, are a much more successful method. Rather than thinking of your brain as a sponge where you just pour in the information, it's much more helpful to focus on how many times you pull the information out. That's called retrieval. And the more you do it, the better you learn. A nice cup of tea solves everything. And so does a pre-recorded video. The pre-recorded video format is a great way to provide just-in-time content. Keep the video short and sweet and students can watch whenever they have a need for that information. In March 2020, our Career Development Office had asked for a video on the professional use of email. Amy Taylor and I met to figure out what we wanted to cover and how to structure the presentation. But we hadn't had a chance to create the slide deck or record the video before we were all sent home. Working from home, we figured out how to make the recording remotely from our separate locations. I began with Englishman Richard Susskind's famous 1996 quote that email would soon become the principal means by which lawyers and clients would communicate, at which point he was nearly drummed out of the profession. But of course, he was right. After I finished serving up the basics of email etiquette, Amy demonstrated several different techniques on how to manage your email inbox. And career development was very happy with our final product. Almost a year later, in spring 2021, we had heard some feedback that our 1L students wanted more Blue Book. So even though our formal legal research classes were over, TJ Streepy recorded three Blue Book videos, basic format for cases, key tables for cases, and signals. Each video is five minutes or less. And in this way, he provided more support for our students as they embarked on writing their appellate briefs. He broke the content up into manageable bite-sized pieces to be easily digested. One of the ways to teach students an experiential skill is by demonstration. And in practice, students often say that they wish they had a way to review the demonstration because they struggled to follow the steps in real time. Demonstration videos can solve this problem because students can watch them on their own time and as many times as they need. You can also have students watch the videos before class so that class time can be spent on higher level skills. I made several videos for each of my research classes this semester, and I aimed for each video to be five minutes or less in length. I also moved at a much slower pace so that students could really take in what I was doing and follow along. I broke down each skill, such as researching and updating cases, into its component parts, and I made a separate video for each one. I used Westlaw, Lexis, and Bloomberg, and I compared each platform as we went along so that students could also learn how to evaluate databases. So we selected cooking with nitrogen as our theme for our content because the thesis we wanted to go with is that we're producing content that approaches something we're used to doing very simply, uh, you know, teaching and composing uh, class material, but we're doing it in a complex but approachable way. When faculty had to shift online, understandably, some were at a loss as to how to make this transition. So we quickly put together some guides and video content to help them figure it out. We basically repackaged knowledge that we already had, um, such as how to use Zoom and Kaltura, how to upload and format content, and we put it into easily accessible and, ma and manageable formats. It looked really complicated, much like cooking with nitrogen, but it was pretty straightforward. Now, what wasn't straightforward was putting together our open educational resources LibGuide. That was a huge effort, about seven different librarians, two different like intra-library teams, and a whole lot of research assistants kind of working in the background. So it was very much a duck on the surface with the feet paddling, you know, furiously under the water. But the end result was fantastic. It was this, it's this extensive, comprehensive libguide with 
all sorts of incredible infographics, easy to use and understand material, and all presented in a really straightforward way. And you never all saw any of the chaos that was going on in the background. Another example of programming that we offered um, was when we used a hybrid synchronous and asynchronous model for uh, some programming we did for Open Access Week. Um, we hosted a screening of the internet's own boy, a documentary about Reddit founder um, and open access advocate, Aaron Swartz. Um, the screening itself was live um, and we had, and it was sort of an interesting method because we had um, a bunch of attendees and we had a faculty Q&A session to kick things off. Um, but then we also recorded the session and provided information uh, to our students to encourage them to watch and discuss off, um, offline um, if they weren't able to make the screening. Uh, in this way, we actually think of this as a great pour over coffee in that it was both this bespoke because it was created for the people who were there on the day, but also easily reproducible for later viewers. It was still great in both methods. Like many of you, we had to rethink events and offerings over the past year, and one of those events was orientation. While our law school's orientation was a hybrid of virtual and socially distanced in person content, the law library did not feel safe hosting our usual law library fest. We were able to use some leftovers in the form of the previous year's library tour video and spice it up with some new COVID related guidance and signage. We omitted parts of the library that would be closed off to students during the pandemic, like our basement and some offices. To introduce ourselves to the incoming 1L class, each library employee sent in a short introduction of themselves. This was during the summer, so many folks recorded themselves at home in casual summer clothes and others were in the office where they felt most productive and comfortable. Rachel skillfully combined all of these short introductions submitted in a variety of formats into one cohesive welcome video for our newest students. Seemingly random but delicious pieces came together on a tastefully arranged board for a perfect meal. Our charcuterie board of content was offered asynchronously on our YouTube channel, as well as part of the orientation course on the law school's learning management system. We plan to use these asynchronous resources even when we go back to in-person events. Before we close, we wanted you all to get a taste of a small slice of our virtual asynchronous orientation programming. Enjoy. Oh. I'm sorry, I didn't see you there. Hello, and welcome to my office slash living room. And by office slash living room, I mean law school. And by welcome, I mean welcome. My name is Jason Tabinas, and I am the information technology librarian. I look forward to seeing you in the law school, in the library, maybe if you're lucky, in my legal research class. Now, if you'd excuse me, Thanks to the CaliCon team for serving up this presentation as part of their programming for 2021. If you have any questions about any of the items we shared here, feel free to reach out to one of our law librarian chefs directly by email. We also look forward to answering and discussing any questions you have in the Q&A or the forum for CaliCon. In the chat and on our session's CaliCon webpage, look for the handout link with our LibGuide, email blast, and video URL examples so you can experience our menu for yourself. Bon appétit. Wonderful. Thank you so much for producing that video. All right, we're going to hold questions until we get to the uh, to the end for everybody. Our, our next uh, video is uh, how I took our annual escape room virtual. Uh, our speaker is uh, Joy Her Cardello of the University of Arizona, James E. Rogers College of Law, and play video. Hi. My name is Joy Hercardillo, and I'm a legal writing professor at the University of Arizona, James E. Rogers College of Law. And today I wanna share with you how we took um, what was a tradition at our law school to end the semester, the fall semester for our 1L students with uh, an escape room competition. And we had to um, make that happen virtually this year. 
And uh, it was it turned out much better than I think we even anticipated. And um, we really learned some um, important lessons along the way that I'd like to share. So let me share my screen with you. So as I said, um, our tradition had been um, to have this escape room and we'd actually only done it for two years now, um, but we were very attached to it. It was just um, a very upbeat way to end the fall semester for our 1Ls. And what we had done is had all of the 1L students come through the escape room in teams of four to six students and every team had an hour to escape the room. And then whoever did it in the least amount of time was the champion. So um, we would stage it in our appellate courtroom. Uh, the, the students would come into the courtroom and get their instructions and then fan out. And we would run this uh, escape room over several days. Uh, we would have the writing fellows in the room with the students so that they would ensure that the students had to solve all of the clues. Once the team had escaped, we would take them out into the library or the lobby and have them, we'd give them placards that they could pose and we'd take their pictures. When we realized we weren't going to be able to do it because of COVID, we were disappointed, but we really were committed to trying to find a way to replicate this experience so at the beginning of the lockdown, I saw some articles about some commercial escape rooms that were figuring out how to make their experience virtual. So I kind of just figured, we'll put this on the calendar. We'll figure out how we're going to do it later because we always ran it at the very end of the semester when the students were ready to leave for Thanksgiving. So um, my director, uh, Susie Salman, was 100% behind it and I just basically figured, okay, you know, I've got to come through somehow and figure out how we're going to do this. So uh, where do you start? I, as I mentioned, I found these articles, but then when I looked into the commercial escape rooms, they had really more professional websites than we were prepared to tackle. What I found most helpful was on YouTube, there were several elementary school teachers that shared techniques that ways that they had created um, essentially escape rooms. They used uh, Google Slides and they also used uh, Google Sites, which was a Google tool I wasn't even familiar with. But these two videos that I've got here were probably the most helpful for me. The first one taught me how to uh, basically create a Google Slide and then populate it with things that, uh, that the students could click on that would um, sometimes take you outside the Google slide or take you to another Google slide. Um, and then uh, the second one uh, kind of expanded upon that and showed how you could embed the Google slides into a Google site and just basically build the whole escape room on a single site. Before I could really create the Google site, there were certain things that, you know, certain steps you have to take. One of the first things that we would do is create the backstory. Now, in the past, we would kind of had the writing fellows that were responsible for staging and organizing and creating the escape room. And they would come up with a backstory, an explanation for why these people were stuck inside an escape room. Because of the time constraints and just the fact that I wasn't even sure how, how we could even pull this off, I went ahead and created the backstory. Um, but I did continue to have the writing fellows create clues. And then you need to develop the flow of the rooms. You want your clues to kind of um, lead into one another, especially here where we're going to have all of the students uh, complete all of the clues. We had to create a virtual site. Um, we had to figure out, well, what were we going to use for locks? In the past, I had this collection of combination locks and a locking safe. And uh, for this, we used Google Forms. One thing that was really different, too, is that scheduling for the uh, virtual escape room was so much easier because multiple teams could go in um, at the same time. You didn't need to stagger the team. And then another fun um, benefit, and this was the idea of, of one of my writing fellows, was that we could um, bring other uh, faculty into the project 
by asking them to record some videos and kind of incorporating those videos into the clues. So uh, this is my Google site and I've got it here live. Let me bring it on over. So when I log on to it, um, because this site belongs to me, this is what I see. And this is what the students see. Um, and uh, so here's the backstory for them. And then here's the courtroom. The first courtroom is a hearing on a defendant's motion to exclude. And uh, this started, um, this is a Google slide. And when I first created it, I just put a photograph of an empty courtroom. Um, so I populated it completely. I just searched the internet for um, people and images and things and objects. Sometimes you can find them um, with transparent backgrounds, but other times I just took something, copied and pasted an image, and then put it into Word and used the remove background feature um, for the picture edit in Word, and then just saved it as a PNG. And that uh, let me just paste it into, into the courtroom. So, uh, so the students are told, start here, they're also in every courtroom given an easel, which is where they go to unlock the room. But first they've got to solve clues. So this um, opens up a clue. And from which country did the United States adopt the common law, go back to the courtroom to solve the clue. So when they go back to the courtroom, they look around and they see, oh, picture of King George. And um, so they click on that. And this actually takes them to a video, Hamilton video. Sansa, Aria, and their half-brother John decided to go see the Broadway musical Hamilton. As so I won't have you listen to the whole thing, but it's basically a, a scenario that's set up that they're watching Hamilton and they get spit on because uh, the actor that plays King George is notorious for spitting while he sings. So the question is, you know, what law controls this situation? So we give them um, a statute. This is an Arizona statute. Here's a New Jersey statute. Um, and then here's the New York statute, which because this is on Broadway, the students have to figure out jurisdiction, mandatory authority, that kind of thing. They click here and they're told this is the correct answer. And it's correct now to get, to find the combination to get out of this courtroom, you will need to get your papers organized. So uh, they can go back to the courtroom and that gives them a clue that this stack of papers is where they wanna go next. That opens up a Google Doc um, th that um, has uh, some, text that um, they're supposed to organize in the CREAC paradigm, conclusion, rule, explanation, application, conclusion. Um, but, oh, look, this is completely uh, gibberish. Thing. You're going to need to figure out how to, and when they go to the iPad and click on the iPad, that takes them to a converter website. This is one of the longer clues that we had but they are able to uh, encrypt or decrypt the text. And of course, then it's just a matter of clicking here. And that takes them to, this is the LRAC escape room lock and they need to enter their professor. Those were the post-it notes. I just granted your motion and you've unlocked your first room here is where you go to the second room. So uh, the second courtroom has it's a about place time to you start. got here, counsel. So this is the video. Oh, sorry. I didn't see you there. Just give me one moment. Just... So this was a fun uh, little lecture um, that Andrew Woods gave them. Um, and then it sends them back to the courtroom with the admonition that they'll have to hit the books, which takes them to that clue. Um, and that's a hierarchy of authority clue, which it says um, you will, there will be an obvious mnemonic acronym, which you will no doubt find helpful in the courtroom. 
Well, um, so once they put them in order, the acronym is phone, which takes them to the iPhone, which then takes them to a legal research clue, um, which uh, when they successfully do this, this is at the Socrative website. So it's a quiz. After they complete the quiz and come back to the courtroom, they're told, oh, your case is going to be a while. Good thing you brought work with you which then brings them to um, this final clue where they have to organize and identify one, oops, one and then the combination for this room. Again, uh, congratulations, judge denied the motion, um, which they were opposing the motion, so that's a good outcome. And uh, now they're into the third courtroom. And this one was uh, fun. I always enjoy a good theme. I don't know if you can hear, there's a snake rattle. They arrive to find that the court is empty and they're told click on the judge's chair to find out where everyone went. So you see snakes all over the screens. So we had a lot of fun with this, with a basic snake theme. Uh, we took them to some websites where there were trivia games that involved, um, and we incorporated snakes on the plane. Um, but this is also uh, the Chris Griffin um, video where he talks to them. Uh, hey there, this is Professor Griffin coming to you on route back to Tucson on FRCP flight 12B6. So the Blue Book clue um, took them once, once they solved the Blue Book quiz, then that took them to a trivia site, which then told them to go back to the Professor Griffin video and to figure out um, what the clue to the lock was from the Griffin video. So um, it was rule 45D3. Um, and if they put the wrong rule in, they would get a, a message, try again, or if they put the wrong combination in, try again. So now this is the final room and um, we don't need to spend a ton of time here. Again, this was um, fully populated by oh, me. Um, so it started with the Red Book quiz that took them to an offsite uh, trivia website. And then ultimately um, they came back and I think the final one was the laptop and that actually took them and um, this crossword puzzle when it gets solved um, gives them the final clue. So here um, is the crossword puzzle almost filled in. So um, they get it right and then to escape this last courtroom, your combination is we came, we saw, we conquered. So um, back to minute. Congratulations, you escaped, celebrate. And this is quite corny, but they all seem to enjoy it. Um, I created some virtual placards uh, to substitute for the real placards that I used to make. And um, here are some screenshots of some successful teams who escaped. So it was a lot of fun. And uh, I'm really happy to answer any questions. If uh, you're inclined to try and tackle something like this, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm, I'll share my materials. I'll uh, walk you through the process. It's uh, it may seem more daunting than it is. Uh, it really was a lot of fun. And um, thanks for listening. Oh, my gosh, that was fantastic. Um, is, a, is the escape room, can I, can I ask a quick question? Is the escape room still open? Can we play? Yes, it is. It is. Although some of the links to quizzes off off site um, aren't necessarily running. 
but you could definitely, um, it's still live and published, so you could uh, feel free to poke around. <laughs> oh, so you should drop the link in the chat if you're, if you're, if you're willing. Um, I didn't sure. want to put you on the spot, but that would be awesome. Thank you. It's, all, it's also on my slides, so. Oh, great, great. All right, uh, our, our last uh, presentation is uh, not a video. Uh, using digital escape rooms and synchronous or asynchronous online classes. And uh, we've got Beth Caldwell from Southwestern Law School. Beth, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let me just pull up my PowerPoint. Uh, and thank you, Joy. That was a great introduction to some of what I'm going to cover too. I learned a lot from your presentation. So I'm glad that we get to connect in, in this way. And I look forward to learning more from what you've done. Uh, I'm a novice at this, but I tried it out this year and was really blown away with my students' reaction and with, with the potential for it. So I wanted to share what I had experienced with uh, this group. So I want to touch on just four big topics. What is an escape room? In case anybody's wondering, uh, I think you have a pretty good sense after Joy's presentation. Why use one in a law school environment? I'll spend the bulk of my time walking you through some examples and then wrap things up with a few tools that I found useful uh, because hopefully you'll be inspired to give it a try yourself. So real quick, what is an escape room? It's something people do for fun. Uh, started out, I think, uh, more physically. People go and they pay and they have to do some teamwork, solve a series of puzzles and challenges to get out. Increasingly, that has moved virtual. And so um, educators have incorporated it as a way to engage students more with the learning process. Why use one in law school? I think you just saw from Joy's presentation, it's a very engaging way to present the material that you want students to be engaging with anyway. So it's basically a way to repackage what you want them to learn, but in a way that's more engaging, more creative. And they have to be very active. So it certainly promotes active learning. They have to be pressing on buttons, answering questions. And a third key point here is it inspires collaborative learning. Most of the time an escape room is structured that students work together in a small group to solve the challenges. And so these are three great reasons to uh, consider incorporating an escape room either into a synchronous class or into an asynchronous class. I got great feedback when I tried it out this past year. I started getting emails and students uh, reaching out to me to say that it was the best class they had had so far in law school. Um, I did it synchronously in a Zoom session in breakout groups and got really great feedback. And at the same time, we were covering the material that I wanted to cover anyway. So I wasn't sacrificing anything pedagogically. It was just a different way to, uh, to encourage students to participate. So with that, I'm going to dive into some examples. I'm going to um, pull up a video to share a few different examples to give you some food for thought, and then um, I'll come back and share some tools. The first example I'd like to share with you is an online digital escape room I designed for use during one of my criminal procedure Zoom classes. The students worked through this in breakout sessions guided by a TA. The TA was sort of the leader to help to move things along and then the students would discuss each step of the process. I also used Google Slides to design this so there's a background image and I embedded different images with links to them. I won't go into too much about the nuts and bolts of how to do this because at the end of my presentation, I'll refer you to a much more in-depth presentation that is what inspired me to give this a try. And that will get into much more of the how-to. For our brief time together, I more just wanna highlight ideas about the kinds of content that you might think about incorporating into this kind of activity, especially because the other video that I'll link to is not tailored to a law school setting. Whenever I design asynchronous content or digital content, it's always a work in progress. Here, an example of that is that I used a shortcut by using numbers to very clearly signal what follows what in this digital escape room. 
This saved me from having to come up with elaborate links and clues that linked each step to the next, and it worked pretty well. The scene is an interrogation room because I'm using this activity to teach students about custodial interrogations and the constitutional rules that apply in that context. Having the TAs walk the students through this, they did a screen share. It made it a little bit simpler in terms of the level of instructions that I needed to provide because I had a meeting with the TAs and I showed them what they needed to do. I think I could convert this activity fairly easily to be asynchronous without the guidance of a TA or to be self-guided by students in breakout groups, but I would need to add a little bit more in terms of the instructions. So they start here with number one, and that'll get them to an introductory video where I'm breaking down what's going on here. We're gonna use a real world case and some video clips from that case in order to analyze various real world facts and how they pertain to the law that we've been studying about interrogation. As you'll recall, we've discussed three primary so I give them a brief reminder of the basic constitutional rules that we've studied with respect to interrogations. And then their first activity is a drag and drop where they have to match up which constitutional amendments apply to which set of rules that we've been studying. This is just to prime them, to remind them about the key rules that we've studied so that they're ready to dive into applying them. They'll then come back to the interrogation and click on number two. Once they open up number two, there is a clip from the documentary that we're going to be using to analyze the issues here. And so it's a two minute clip, two and a half minutes. There are a few embedded questions that they can answer as they're going through. That would require some level of group discussion so they can decide upon an answer. So they're asked a question based on what they've seen so far to try to prime them about the theory of the case. They have to answer it, then they can continue along. And we have real footage from a court case, so it gives them a chance to really apply the law in a simulated real world setting. It just continues along. I splice between multiple choice questions, videos where I pop up, uh, video clips from this documentary, etc. At one point, there's a phone that they click on. It leads to a video. Hi there. This is so that's a simulated phone call from a supervisor asking them to reconsider a previous consideration about the Miranda issue based on some new footage that they just viewed from the video. This all leads up to number eight, which when they get there, they have a chance to enter the unlock code. So once they put their answer in, they can click check. If they get three out of three, it lights up green, and that's their sign that they can return to the classroom, that they have successfully unlocked the lock, and they are free to come back to class. The nice thing about doing this synchronously was that then we could have a chance to debrief. If they had any questions that came up during the activity, I could debrief with them right away. That said, escape rooms can also work really well for asynchronous learning. I'm going to show you an example of an asynchronous escape room next. Here, I take the Fourth Amendment and I tell the students, the Fourth Amendment applies to outer space now. So let's apply some of the rules that we've learned to somebody who is trying to save the world, save the galaxy from destruction. I should note that this was designed for students to do asynchronously on their own time as a review exercise. They could either do it individually or with a group if they prefer to, let's say, work with their study group on this activity. It starts here with an introductory video. students are told that they have a hunch that the people or beings on this flying saucer have something to do with the plans to destroy the galaxy, but they don't have probable cause and they don't have reasonable suspicion 
And so they're asked if they wanted to conduct a stop of this flying saucer that complies with the Fourth Amendment, what might they need to do or what could empower them to make that kind of stop? So I'm trying to get them to think like a police officer might be thinking so that they can get clear in their heads what are these outer boundaries of the Fourth Amendment. Once they click on the flying saucer, they're taken to a page that I designed using an add-on feature to Canvas called H5P, and it allowed me to design this page that's rather interactive. So they can click here for an audio introduction, which is also summarized here in writing, and then they're asked a true or false question. They can check their answer to that question, and then they proceed along here to another screen. So here they're asked to think about which of these following exceptions would be the top three that they might want to be exploring. I'm trying to help them to remember what are the three exceptions I always want them to think about when they have a stop of a vehicle or an automobile. And then there's a video that I've embedded that I did not create. It found it online. And after the students go through the series of questions that I was just showing, they would be directed back here. They'd click on this and they'd have a series of questions and activities to go through for that. Finally, once they have the, all of the, the clues that they need, they'll click on the Save the World button to enter the clue and to escape from the room. This is an asynchronous escape room activity that I'm planning for my criminal law students for the coming fall. And the idea is that they'll work in small groups to complete this activity. It's designed to help them to apply the rules that we've already studied in class that define various theft offenses. This can be a confusing area for students to figure out because there are a bunch of different crimes with elements that are somewhat similar. So this is meant to give them some practice with applying what we've already covered in class to a fictional scenario. They'll start here by clicking on this link on the detective. The link will take them to this video which I have embedded on a Canvas page. And they'll be able to view the video. It'll introduce them to what they'll have to do in this problem. And they'll get a clue or a question at the end of the video. You've been called in to help solve a crime, and unfortunately you'll be stuck here until you can do so. A woman who called herself Rachel is wanted for theft of a Beverly Hills jewelry store. She spoke with the owner and said she had several high-end clients. She dropped their names, she shared fake business cards, and she even showed off a fake website to the store's owner. She convinced him that she was in fact a high-end celebrity stylist, but she's not. She left the store with three items that did not belong to her, a diamond tiara, a diamond ring, and a pair of ruby earrings. The store has now hired a private investigator to help track Rachel down. She's hiding out somewhere in LA County. In order to get more information about where she's hiding, you'll need to answer a series of questions about what crimes Rachel should be charged with. After you determine which crime is applicable to each stolen item, you'll be given a clue that you'll ultimately use to help to find her and to escape from this room at the end of this exercise. Let's get started with the stolen tiara. Click on the tiara in the main room to learn more about this crime. So here was an example where the actual video told them where the next place they should go would be. They got that clue that they should next click on the tiara. So that's one way that you can set things up that each clue tells them where to go next. I took sort of the lazy way out with the numbering system. So I didn't have to necessarily have all of the clues in there and that also worked fine. So I think some of this is just figuring out what you can make work. I'm gonna fast forward a bit and then wrap things up but I'll show you a, a couple other pieces here. This is an example of a video I made in Doodly, which you can use to create a cartoon video. I'll play just a little bit. It's setting up a hypo for the students to work through. Stylist, and she asked if he had any items that she could borrow for styling her big name clients for the Oscars. So I think you can get the idea there. You can come up with whatever scenario you want and use this software 
I didn't draw any of this. I just picked the characters. It's somewhat limited, but it's a way that you can create additional content to set up hypos that you want the students to work through. At the end of this video, then they get some questions to think through where they have to decide what the appropriate charge for the theft of the tiara would be. And that requires that they think through the various differences in the elements through uh, these theft crimes that I'm trying to sharpen their understanding about. So um, with, with that, I think I'll stop there and then I, I will drop a link in the chat box with the link to the video that I mentioned so that you can uh, check that out if you're inspired to learn more about how to put one of these together yourself. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Thanks to all the presenters. So now, uh, now we go to Q and A. Um, I'm going to pull it up, but uh, while while I'm scanning through, um, I'll ask the obvious question for the escape room folks. Uh, how many hours does it take to build an escape room? <laughs> how hard is that? Well, it you know it it depends on how complicated you want it to be. Um, but I had so much fun. Honestly, I didn't keep track. What else was I going to do during a pandemic? <laughs> All right. it, 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 it took me a long time. Um, and there were times when I sort of regretted, like, what am I doing? Um, but that said, um, the, the class was just really fun and engaging. And I think they got to interact with the material so well. So it was kind of uh, rewarding, but especially creating all the content for the first time, it's a lot of work. But then the idea is I think you could continue to use it, um, at least in my situation, which um, makes it feel a little bit less burdensome. Excellent. Yeah, this, there was a lot of creativity in, in that work. And it's, it's, it's an unfair, it's a bit of an unfair question to say, how long does it take to make art? Um, but, uh, you know, I, I guess I wanted to get an idea of uh, what, what, what type of investment uh, people are. Um, uh, I, I thought I thought I saw that you linked to that YouTube. There was somebody who put up a YouTube video, uh, and, and also in her, in the YouTube on how to build escape rooms using Google Slides and sites, which was uh, a, a good starting place for a lot of folks. Did, right? Is that right? Yeah, I had a couple links on um, one of my slides that is the two elementary school teachers. Those those were super helpful. Yeah, and then I just added in a link in the chat to a, a one and a half hour video that a professor of, of Spanish language created um, and posted through the professors at play group. I don't know if anybody's heard of that, but it's very creative. And she goes into a lot of the how to, like how to open up a Google slide and get the transparent image and all of that. Very good. For the OGA folks, did you, did you, um... Were, were, were these materials primarily an orientation or a pre-law thing? Or uh, I, I assume because they're asynchronous students could come and do them anytime they want, but, but when did you, um, you know, when, when did you try to get the students to uh, first tell they them? They were all different things all throughout the semester, but we tried to time them to when everybody needed them the most. Ah, excellent, excellent. And, and um, I would just add that, um, Maybe this happened at other schools too, but part of our orientation was asynchronous. Um, and so uh, that went, um, that content went out to them um, through our uh, learning management platform. And um, then some of our content was just for 1Ls, some of it um, was for all students. So um, it was uh, a mixed bag. Uh -huh. And most of the stuff you showed, it's not behind a password. Uh, folks, uh, folks can see it on the on the open web. Yes, it's all um, every single item that we talked about on all the various slides and all the various types of uh, instruction that we offered. All of it um, has a link in the PDF handout that I put in the chat, and that's also on our um, presenter page in the CaliCon website. So if you go to that PDF, there are hyperlinks for an example of every single person's portion of this presentation, and none of those are password protected. You can watch them on YouTube or look at our LibGuide, and some of them are a combination of YouTube and LibGuides together. Cool. Here's a question for the escape room folks. How... Uh... Which is better, virtual or live? Or I should say, I think that means asynchronous or 
or synchronous? <laughs> I, I would say probably synchronous if you can put teams together. Um, one of the things um, that we did is we had the writing fellows that work with those students. Our, our students are already in teams and they have a writing fellow assigned to them. So they would, the writing fellows had really explicit instructions. They knew all the clues and the answers to the clues so they could help them navigate through. So that I think made it um, less frustrating. Yeah, I, I think if you can structure it so that it's synchronous, it's nice because like I was popping around between the breakout groups too and I had the TA so they didn't get stuck. Um, but, you know, I think when I crafted the review um, uh, activity, I thought, you know, well, that's also something cool. If they get stuck, they can just email me. They're not on a time crunch and it's just a different way that they could engage. So I think it sort of depends on what your goal is um, and how complicated it's going to be. You know, I, I see a lot of uh, basic questions about escape rooms and uh, um, I'll, I'll answer it, but you tell me if I'm wrong. Before you go design a virtual escape room, maybe you should go run through some virtual escape rooms so that you get a sense of, 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 how, of how they operate. But, but you guys had a lot of creativity in how you asked questions and clues. And, and that seemed to be somewhat dependent on the tools you used, right? I mean, uh, some of it was Google Forms and, and just like, you know, uh, figure out the answer, reveal and type it in. Uh, and, and, you, and and I think you all, one of the other one was was using H5P, which gave you more types of interactive questions to ask, right? But had you guys run through uh, other uh, online escape rooms before this? Not, you know? I had not. I'd done a live escape room <laughs> with, ah. and with students, and that was what made me decide we should do this with our own students and create our own. Um, but I mean, other than the the elementary school kind of poking around and watching theirs, there was one commercial site that had you could kind of do a sample, and I did go into theirs, and they that was where I got the idea to do the encrypted um, clue, so which was ridiculously long and complicated. My understanding is escape rooms usually involve a lot of beer. Um, and, uh, and I've seen an online synchronous one, a company that sells tickets, and the, the person has like a GoPro on their head, and you're directing them, you know, you see their hands in, in, the, in view, and you're directing them to go pick something up or open something or stuff like that. At the beginning of lockdown, that seemed to be what a lot of physical escape rooms were doing. So, but then a more true virtual version started popping up as well. And I've been um, homeschooling my kindergartner and second grader. So I had experimented with escape rooms that um, just really low tech stuff just to get them to focus on learning at home. So that was my experience. Isn't, isn't law school just one big escape room? <laughs> All right, look it up some questions. What's the ideal size for a group of students to go through an escape room? I, I would say um, no more than six. Otherwise, you'll have people who won't really engage and participate. So four to six seems good for synchronous. Very good. All right. Any other questions? Last words? Um, we, we had a question in the chat about viewership um, that I just wanted to briefly address. Um, so on our YouTube page, I would say like anywhere from 30 to 60 views is pretty normal. Um, oh, some of our most popular things are our stress busters. So um, Heather made tea live um, to teach people how to make tea and then also scones. Um, later, but uh, that has well over 100 views, um, as does uh, some like brief meditations that um, Rachel and Heather created. So I think that's our most popular content on YouTube. Um, the, the MailChimp that we did about um, study tips, um, how to study efficiently, 
Um, we had 373 opens, which we were really thrilled about. And uh, almost half of those students um, then clicked on something in the email. So um, we're trying to, to maybe communicate less, but when we do communicate, make sure it's very valuable um, and it's curated and succinct, so. Absolutely, I, I loved your metaphors um, in the presentation and in the, uh, in the materials. They were very engaging. Um, and, you're, and you're right, I mean, you, we're, we're bombarded with so much information and the students of course are bombarded with so much information. You better be relevant and relevant fast so that they're not just like, eh, I'm not watching that. Too long did read, TLDR. All right, well, folks, thank you very much. That was a, that was a fantastic cluster of sessions. I really appreciate it. And uh, we're now gonna go on to an actual one hour break where there's nothing happening. Woo! And, uh, and then one last uh, cluster of sessions and then the reception. So thank you very much and see you all in an hour.